this certainly will be a wake-up call for uh, Europe and the world that uh, there are consequences to an escalating uh, conflict in eastern Ukraine, that it is not going to be localized, it is not going to be contained. Um, you know, what, what we've seen here is um, just in one country alone, uh, our, our great allies, uh, the Dutch, 150 or, or more uh, of their citizens uh, being killed. Um, and, and that, I think, sadly brings home the degree to which uh, the stakes are high for Europe. Uh, not simply for the Ukrainian people, and, and that we have to be firm in our resolve in making sure that uh, uh, we are uh, supporting uh, Ukrainians' efforts uh, to bring about uh, a just ceasefire uh, and that we can move towards a political solution to this. It's difficult in a world filled with political and opportunistic liars to find one that is working at the level of Vladimir Putin at the moment. Then again, ask anyone who is even a casual student of watching the world over the last decade or so, if this would surprise anybody, but he's been lying for years with zero reason to worry the world will be able to touch him. So what, if anything, has really changed at the present? That and much more from Inside the Beltway. Let's welcome to Midpoint former speechwriter for Bill Clinton and now editor-in-chief of the Washington Monthly, Paul Glastris joins us. Paul, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Ed. Paul, the president in his press conference talked about consequences for Vladimir Putin and for Russia. Honestly now. Are there people within Washington who believe that there are real consequences here? Because as I noted, Putin has been getting away for this for years, with this for years. What makes anybody think that the president now has the juice to make him knuckle under? Well, I think there have been consequences all along, and he's been feeling them. And, you know, the Russian economy is not an isolated economy the way it was uh, during the Cold War. It's integrated with the rest of the world economy. They have flows of money, goods. Uh, exports, imports, and uh, the president, just a couple days prior to this incident, uh, put out tougher sanctions on Russia um, as a consequence of the buildup of uh, uh, activity in eastern Ukraine. Um, and now with this horrible tragedy, he has leverage in the form of support from Europe, which previously was not interested in losing some money of its own in order to back up these sanctions. Now we're hearing just this morning from EU leaders that they're uh, uh, getting behind the sanctions the president put forward, as is the Canada and some other countries. So so the, these are not, uh, that's not a small amount of leverage. Um, it's a significant amount of leverage. We'll have to see if it's enough to change Putin's behavior, but it's it, he always had limited uh, means to, to affect change in this part of the world, but he's using what he has, I think, fairly deftly. Paul, I want you to catch this now because here's a comment that I'm going to read from Ukrainian Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsin, uh, Yatsenyuk, which I think will launch us a little bit into the next part of this. He says, and I quote this, international crime against humanity must be investigated by the International Commission. I underline once again that we are ready to pass the guidance and coordination of this investigation to the Netherlands as the country that suffered the most with the involvement of the whole international community. Paul, it's those last couple of words, I think, that make me stop and a lot of people to have pause. The international community. Is this president going as far as he can? Because simply put, we need the EU to stand up and do something here when, quite frankly, they have not been willing to do anything and not really been willing to help becoming part of the solution for, for decades now, it seems. Well, I'm not sure I would go so far as not being part of the solution or for decades, but I think unquestionably you're right that the, the Europeans uh, are less willing to uh, enter into these sanctions because their economies are more exposed to Russia. Remember, Russia holds the valve on the natural gas going into Europe. Cut off that natural gas and Europe go, can go into a recession. So European leaders have to be cognizant of their own voters uh, who, who don't want to suffer uh, you know, from their own pocketbooks for the fate of some people in, in Ukraine. Now, I think that calculus has changed politically because, precisely because of the downing of this, of this airliner. Their, their own people have, at least from the Netherlands, have been killed, 150 of them. And so using the international community, especially the EU, as leverage at this point is a, a very smart thing to do. Has Putin been exposed in some ways? Because if you look, the 
real inability to broker a ceasefire. This would seem to many to indicate a real lack of control of the separatist militia here. Now, we've talked about this before, and it would seem as if the fact that Russia says yes, they say no, that simply what we have here is a, a band of thugs, if you will, or free-roaming individuals that Russia really has no control over whatsoever? Well, I'm, I'm not sure they have no control whatsoever, but, you know, it was an enormous blunder on the part of Vladimir Putin and his, uh, his you know, advisors to hand, you know, uh, service-to-air missiles of this, of this uh, quality to what uh, one blogger called a bunch of rustic morons, uh, you know, who <laughs> use it to, you know, inadvertently, I think, shoot down an international jetliner, and he's paying the price for putting in motion uh, events that he cannot hope to control. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he, Russia has already paid a price for this, and I think they're going to continue to pay a price. The price that they will pay for this, in essence, is there anything that they can do at this point or anybody can do to bring Putin to the realization that we had some sort of responsibility in this or is it simply going to be as i pointed out at the front that he will continue to skate and slide as much as he can because he realizes simply put that he can get away with it i i, I do think he knows he can get away with a lot and i think it's you know I, i'm not a mind reader nor an expert on on russian affairs um a lot of this is my understanding is a lot of this has to do with the internal politics of russia by standing up for russia by um, showing Russia's capacity to involve itself in a country right next door and protect ethnic Russians, he shores up his own his own support. He minimizes uh, any threats to his power. So you know th this is a, a lot of this is about domestic affairs. Um, if billions of dollars are being lost by, by allies of Putin's because of economic sanctions, that could change the populace. Paul, I want to spin for a minute if we can here because I want to specifically focus on an article that you had in Washington Monthly that caught my attention, caught a lot of people's attention, simply because of the title that you had on it. It was called The Big Lobotomy, How Republicans Made Congress Stupid. Would you like to expand on that a little bit? Because I will gather that certainly my simply just saying those words will aggravate a few people. Well, I, you know, I would urge people to read the story. It can be read on WashingtonMonthly.com. And it tells the story of basically a 50-year uh, year story beginning in the early 70s when uh, liberal Democrats and moderate Republicans built up the capacity of Congress by hiring staff and creating new agencies to be able to uh, engage in analysis of problems and find solutions uh, in a complex world. And then in 1995, with the rise of Newt Gingrich and his um, revolutionaries in Congress, uh, you found Republicans essentially cutting by 20, 30 percent or more the staff buildup that it ha that happened over the previous 25 years. And it's really never been built back up again. And so even though, and the aim here for Gingrich and others was to uh, get rid of what they thought were people who were getting in the way of conservative uh, legislation, with the aim of shrinking government. Of course, in the 25 years since, government's grown by 50%. So it actually hasn't worked by conservative terms. What it has done is two things. One, absent having this personnel, these experts under their own control, Congress has had to outsource, in a sense, uh, its policymaking to the lobbyists on K Street and to uh, various think tanks and private concerns. Um, and so you you know you you've seen the rise of even greater power in the hands of corporate lobbyists, and the second thing it's done is it's taken away Congress's ability to do oversight over the federal government and other aspects of the country. So what's been the result? Well, I'll give you two examples. Why was it that Congress was completely flat-footed and didn't understand the depth and breadth of the NSA's uh, spying prob uh, programs? Well, here's a fun fact. Um, the, uh, in, in the intelligence budget has doubled in real terms since 1997, 
but the number of staffers in the Senate Intelligence Committee has declined during the same amount of period. Uh, same period. I've only got so about have 20 to... seconds. I've only got about 20 seconds. Can I just ask you quickly, is it fair to say that we need a big lobotomy on both sides in Washington? I think both sides ought to come together and rebuild the capacity of Congress to do its job. And for that, you need personnel who are paid well and stick around and don't go work for lobbyists. And I think that's in the interest of conservatives as well as liberals. Ah, the dirty L word, the lobbyist word, always gets in there some way. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. The article is, of course, on WashingtonMonthly.com. We appreciate your time. We'll do it again. Thank you, Ed. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. On deck, putting the words authentic and Hillary Clinton into the same sentence. Plus a peek at what's making headlines from the Newsmax Mothership website. It's all coming up right here on Midpoint.